the interesting thing about the postmortem is that, and I view that there's two of them, honestly. There is one with the end user and the end user team, and there's one internally. It's the ability in a, a delicate way to point out, we all work together, but it allows you to make the others accountable and to give you credit without them feeling that you're throwing them under the bus or that you're stamping your foot saying, hey, look at me. All of a sudden, you start doing your highlights, right? Your achievements, right? Achievement unlocked, achievement unlocked, achievement unlocked. And then you handle that where you make everybody look good and you present it to the client and they they feel supported with you doing your job. And then you have the internal conversation, which was, you rat after me, but I'm cool with it. We can't have this happen again. I didn't throw you under the bus. You now have to make sure you stop throwing me under the bus. Bleep bloop. Is that a real achievement? Yes, it is. Bleep bloop. Okay, that's it. I quit. Bleep bloop. I had so many achievables. On this episode of A State of Control, we talk about really what a programmer does, the value of programming, and provide some clarity and understanding to the rest of the industry and the world as to the importance of programming and the challenges that programmers face. All that and more on A State of Control. A State of Control, episode 110, Just the Programmer. Welcome to A State of Control, an AV Nation podcast that highlights the control programming and automation aspects of the audiovisual industry. My name is Steve Greenblatt. I'm your host. Thanks for joining us today. So today's show, we're going to be talking a little bit about what programmers do and why they're important and what makes them special. And it might sound a little bit weird uh, for a state of control, but there's plenty of people, I think, that really don't know uh, what it goes into making programming successful. So we're going to talk a lot more about that today, and we're going to try to clear the air and try to educate people and hopefully give people something to point back to, to say, hey, look, this is what I do. So uh, with us today are two uh, returning guests, and I'll introduce them after I get to say hi to my partner here at Estate of Control, Uncle Richie, Rich Fergoza. Hey, Rich, how are you? It's good times. We're ending, heading towards the end of summer here, so moving into the fall shows, right? We're all a little colder. I, I hear you there. We're moving on to our, our guests. Uh, first, we welcome back uh, someone who was last with us in episode 105, and he is Brian McGrogan from Verex. Welcome back, Brian. Thanks. Thank you very much for having me, Steve. It's great to be here and get a chance to talk about all this fun stuff. I like it. <laughs> Excellent. Thanks for being here. And last but not least, we've been trying to – get this guy back on our show for quite some time. And finally, he's here. He's a friend of ours and uh, a, a frequent guest. He was last with us in episode 87, which is quite some time ago. But uh, his name is Bernard Mor Morgan from ICS Plus. Welcome back, Bernard. Hey, th glad to be back. And uh, we need that cool weather here because in Texas, we're still hitting triple digits. So Rich, bring that cold weather this way, please. We've had enough rain in the, in the Northeast to, to last us a, over a month, I think. Yeah, we'll send some to you. So like I mentioned at the top, um, programmers, you could kind of think of them like other professions that when they do their job, people don't really notice them. But when they don't, that's when everybody comes kicking and screaming and says, hey, this is your fault. You got to fix this and go call the programmer because something's wrong. And uh regardless of um, what that is and, and, and why it occurred, programmers really need to kind of have a good handle on everything that's going on because they need to be able to help to resolve issues. And, and a lot of times that gets overlooked. Um, Rich, we, we've talked about the term unsung pro heroes. We, we talked about that in episode 100. It was actually the title of the episode. And, and I really think that that was such a great title for a monumental episode. And um, I, I look at programmers really as being the, the man behind the curtain who, or, or woman behind the curtain who's turning the dials and the levers and making everything work right. But there really is a lack of understanding, I believe, even after all these years for what it goes into making programming and programming programmers successful. So what can we do about that? You actually may be the most experienced person in the room and you get introduced as, oh, this is just our programmer. And you kind of smile and you nod and you, you know, you go through the pleasantries of understanding the process. And the, the most difficult part of programming being part of your skill set 
is learning how to bridge the social and interpersonal elements of being able to advocate for what you do, be proud of what you do, represent yourself as a professional without going the Sheldon Cooper way of trying to explain to everybody how everybody else is wrong and, and, you know, going into the minutia of how the sausage is made. And it's, 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 it's the personalities that find themselves in the programming vein tend to be unique. Um, I, I think just because you're doing solitary work often, some, you know, when you're on site or you're, you're working with other people, but, but you're used to a certain flow and a certain way of thinking <laughs> and, the hardest thing to bridge is not your technical skill set. And we've talked about this so often, right? It's, it's, you can be super, super good at what you do at one facet of what you do, but being successful in this industry means that you have to focus equally as much as collaborating with others to make them as good as possible at what they do. And you are an un unsung hero. I mean, this is, you know, like literally every meeting that I walk into with people is that if you looked at me and said you could do what I did and it was so simple, I did my job. And 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 you have to have a little bit of that thick skin and, and that masochistic streak to know and the confidence to know of a job well done is enough first. Then move forward to the project and then the metrics and, and how you build a business, right? You know, again, as a business owner, you know, Call me whatever you want. Call me, you know, chief, you know, chief bottle washer. Check still clears, baby. I think that those of us that are doing this podcast and, and many of our guests, the reasons that they come to the podcast is because we know that they can communicate. And, and so I don't want to be you know, preaching to the choir, but, but I, what you said, Rich, is really important and something that I very much profess is that we, we, we focus so much on technical, but we don't necessarily focus on the professional development. Um, Brian, I'll, I'll, I'll um, have you jump in on this. Um, in somebody in a role where you are really tasked with being that technical expert, where do you find time to 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 grow that skill? And and um, how do you balance that with learning the other things that you have to learn? I find that time after the kids go to bed is usually when I find that time, or I force myself into a situation where I have to learn it i.e. I put it in my house and my wife says, this doesn't work. Why? <laughs> I need my house to work. But it is it is finding that time and carving out that time that can be so difficult. For myself, I block time off on my calendar and I, I end up booking over it all the time, but I block certain segments where, you know, I'm going to put aside some time to work on this device or work on this this thing. And, you know, I might end up with 15 minutes of downtime, you know, while I'm going between meetings and for once, nobody's uh, hitting me up on Zoom. And so I can get back into something. I can take a look. And it, it can be a real challenge. It can be a real challenge to find the time. But it is important to. You know, I find sometimes even if at night when I'm trying to calm down and get ready to go to bed, if I scroll through some articles on my phone, right, I might have flagged some things from the day, you know, just reading about different things, uh, you know, looking back and, and seeing what's coming, you know, what, uh, what I have to think about that that's very helpful. And there, there's something that Rich said that that really hits home too. um, kind of noting your wins, right? Like we get these punch lists at the end of the day and this punch list has all the things that are wrong. Like Rich said, and what I like to do with my punch list recently is instead of just deleting the things that I fixed or cross them out, I keep those in a separate column of here are the things that we've gotten right. Here are the things that are now working. And let's watch the list dwindle and, you know, the, the wins get longer and the, uh, you know, not necessarily the losses, but the, the items to work through get shorter and shorter and shorter. So I can see all the things that, you know, so when I look over, I'm like, oh, man, this still isn't working. I'm like, wait, hold on. We got through 90 percent of this. We're in, we're in good shape at the moment. We got all the major things that just from a, a mental health standpoint at the end of the day makes me feel a lot better. And I think a lot of the things that you mentioned, although we talked about applying them in technical areas, they could be applied in so many different professions that those are very much um, professional habits that 
people use to be able to 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 work through situations and and to to create that discipline. So that that's that's really good stuff. I, Bernard, I'll I'll um I wanted to key in on something that Rich said about the getting paid part. <laughs> it's a, for you and me and Rich and 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 Brian as well. But but when you're the one that uh, not only uh, receives the checks but signs the checks, it's it's not just a uh, a matter of getting the project done, but it's also making sure that you get acknowledgement for jo a job well done and, and you're earning um, the, the trust of, of your client. Um, going back to what we said in the beginning, where where do we demonstrate that value that we provide? It, it, you know, Because the expectation is, is that it's going to work. Well, I think one of the biggest things, and we've always talked about this, is when someone says, I'm programming the job, we can't stop there. We have to basically peel that onion and say, okay, what is your definition of programming so we can advocate for ourselves? Because so many times, like, you know, hey, are we setting up the network? Are we doing the firmware? Are we doing the DSP? All that gets into – are we doing the commissioning? I think commissioning of a system is different from programming, but those words just all seem to go under one umbrella called programming. And when you're having a conversation about – quoting a job, scoping a job, and doing the job, they don't all line up the same at the same time. It just comes up with this big umbrella of programming, and I think one thing that we need to do as programmers is be able to advocate for ourselves in a professional way of saying, okay, I know this says programming, but my under you know, this is what we – scope to do. This is what we agreed to do. Although we have the skill set or we have the knowledge, or we may not be the best at this particular item, but we know enough to be part of the conversation. We need to make sure even if we're not part of that to be – that's not part of our scope, we get brought into that. We need some acknowledgement of that, and a lot of times I don't think it needs to be financial. right? It's nice to be part of the financial, but to know that you're going outside of your scope for the better of the project is sometimes just making sure everyone knows that. Say, hey, my scope was X, but hey, I think I have some input here that can help solve this issue. And I think so many times this industry has just roped programming under eight or nine different large items that should be different line items on a quote or different line items on a bid. You ran it all, run it all together as programming. You got to unpack that so we know, how, you know, how much resources are being applied to what area. And that's also important on the post mortem of the job to understand. Hey, this was all under programming, but I only spent twenty percent of my time programming. I spent the other eighty percent doing X, Y, and Z. And I think that's when you put those items together. That's how we kind of move things forward. You made a real good point there too, Bernard, right about the post mortem. I feel like that doesn't happen enough. And during my projects, especially when I'm on a project that I feel like is is kind of creeping up and going to go over, I try to take copious notes of things that I don't want to say were necessarily outside of my scope, but were definitely should have been under somebody else's umbrella. Of, I'm working on this, you know, this is costing me five hours, or this is costing me whatever, so that we can come back in a post mortem and say, okay, to learn from this next time, this was supposed to happen here, but it, it costs us so much to do it down the line, so that we can hopefully learn from that and do it better the next time. And I think it's, the, it's we have to advocate for ourselves that always hours doesn't meet equal cost or cost doesn't always meet equal hours. But for a project manager, they need to know what their resources are doing and are they staying on budget on time. And if we as the programmers, we normally just do this, oh, I'll take care of it and sweep it under the rug. If we keep on doing that, at some point, we're going to sweep the whole programming process under the rug and say, hey, well, the whole thing, oh, it takes me 10 minutes, right? And that's part of the problem. For so long, we just kind of took care of it and didn't advocate for ourselves and say, hey, just so you know, we spent two hours, three hours, 25 minutes, 30 minutes doing this just to hit heads up so next time you can account for that in your resource loading because I think a lot of times it's like, hey… We want to get this job done in the time frame you want to get it on, done because we all have to move on to the next item. How many times are you willing to do a postmortem? Because like when the job is done, it was like, okay, we're going, we're moving. The interesting thing about the postmortem is that, and I view that there's two of them, honestly. There is one with the end user and the end user team, and there's one internally. Because just diplomatically, politically, just, you know, again, you 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 have to 
approach them differently, but they're both equally as important. The one with the end user is important, and we, and we do this. We we do we we absolutely do kind of the recap. And again, a lot of what we do is rescues, right? We we come in after the fact, and we we basically have to say, hey, here's what happened. Here's what we did to begin with, without throwing the prior company under the bus, without throwing the uh, general contractor under the bus or the electrician or the security contractor or, you know, again, and, and it's going to happen across industries. You know, I bring it up in residential because in bespoke resi, whew, you know, there's a lot of personalities in play. And, and it's why I like resi because it makes me actually more valuable in a commercial environment because I'm so used to navigating delicate personalities. There's, there's a, a bit of delicacy that occurs when you're dealing with somebody in their home that we don't always translate to in a boardroom or anything else because it's a little depersonalized, but it's still important. These are project managers that are on the line, you know, for the budget that they sit and for recommending the company. But, the, you know, I'm just going to swing back to this is that the reason why it's important is because it allows you as a group and say, you've got a PM there, you've got the sales guy, you've got the, the, the consultant, even it's the ability in a, a delicate way to point out we all work together, but it allows you to make the others accountable and to give you credit without them feeling that you're throwing them under the bus or that you're stamping your foot saying, hey, look at me. It provides the opportunity, just like Brian said, you know, here here was the list that what we had. Here are how we generated the wins in order to generate the wins. Let me walk you through what occurred. You had this, this, and this. Always our goal is to be able to reach the end of the project. So what we did, our team came in and we took care of these, these items that we know your IT, you know, your, your inside IT was overburdened. So we went, reached out to, you know, video conference manufacturer X and we dealt with this for you. And we were happy to, because in the interest of getting the project done at work, your sales engineer worked with us to make through. We checked with the field engineers. We worked with even just getting key cards so that we could come in after hours to take care of this. All of a sudden, you start doing your highlights, right? Your achievements, right? Achievement unlocked, achievement unlocked, achievement unlocked. Um, and then you handle that where you make everybody look good and you present it to the client and they, they feel supported with you doing your job. And then you have the internal conversation, which was, you rat after me, but I'm cool with it. We can't have this happen again. I didn't throw you under the bus. You now have to make sure you stop throwing me under the bus. One thing we keep on forgetting that everything we do is custom, right? And it custom doesn't mean that it's this one off that you're never going to use again. But every project we do is custom to a point. And I go back and you go download Angry Birds. How many revisions have you had of Angry Birds on your a silly little game? How many revisions they have of that? And I think in the process of what you're saying, Rich, we have to keep in mind that everything we do is custom. Now it doesn't mean that it, it's this. Rue Groberg, it can't be done again, but it's custom that it's going to need some type of revision at some point, and that's part of the process as well. And I go back to Angry Birds because that's a silly little game, but how many how many revisions are there on that now? I, you know, that's one of the things that I'll tell the customer is, hey, I'm human. I'm not perfect. I'm sure there is a bug or 20 in there somewhere, and we're here to help work through that too. If you find something that doesn't work, well, let me know. I'm going to fix it, right? I'm going to make it right. So I think, again, to get back to what Richard's saying, connecting on that interpersonal level and having those skills so that people understand that, hey, I'm not some troll in the dark room that you're not allowed to talk to. Like, I'm here to support you. I'm here to have the relationship and, and work together on. So and then, you know, from a business perspective, right, that gets you referrals, that gets you other projects, that gets you, you know, recognition there. So it's a win-win all around. I think that there's a lot of situations where programming isn't get, getting the pricing or the or the value being put on it because it's just this small, almost intangible part of a project. Um, and Brian, I'll c come back to you on this. How, how do we make more awareness around the fact that there's you know that there there are um, legitimate costs and you're getting significant value because of 
the effective programming because it's it, that, that's also a, a, a common struggle that, that we have. Really a big portion of that is educating internally and externally what the programmer actually does, right? One of the things that Bernard said, like unpacking that onion, right? To, you know, your end user, I'm the person that typed on the keyboard, hit load and this graphic displayed on a touch screen, right? Or, you know, or, or, or many different types of interfaces. But, it, you know, in reality, you know, we did six things at once, which, you know, we allowed the project to finish on time um, and do that. But just letting them know, you know, what pieces we're going to work with. We're going to touch every piece of equipment, even if I don't talk to it necessarily, to make sure it's up to date, to make sure it's secure, right? We're going to, we're going to touch the networking side. We're going to do this. I'm doing way more than what you might think of as your traditional programming. You know, I'm going to help the overall entire system from soup to nuts across every department that's in, involved with it. So you know, when, when Bernard had said that before the unpacking onion, I, I realized yesterday one of the projects I was working on had code on this screen, touch panel on this screen, remote session over on my third screen to the text laptop, had a script running to load all the firmware for all the AVRA IP endpoints, had another script running to load the eight touch panels as well as loading code. It was just kind of all happening at the same time. And I don't think it, it's easy to translate that, right? To know. No, Brian, you're just programming. That's all. You're the, I don't need you to do all that. I just need you to program. Right. And, the, and this morning, the you know the tech couldn't find a file, and I was on my phone in the daycare parking lot, downloading it to my OneDrive, and then shooting it off through Zoom on my phone to him, like, here you go, so he didn't lose twenty five minutes waiting for me to get back home. I, I, that actually, so if we were able to present to the the, the general industry or, or or clients, you know, what what could we say? And Bernard, I'll start with you about the these are the things that we could do to make this easier and that it, there wouldn't be as much uh, complication and, and um, red tape involved in programming. We have to define what we're doing. And when you say, I, I just need you to program a job, we have to say, stop. Can you tell me what your definition of that is? So we can unpack that. I'm not, we're not trying to be obtuse. We're trying to make sure we give you what you ask for and it, by nature, programmers have to ask a lot of questions and ask and some difficult questions. But in order to make sure we give you what you want or what you need, we have to make sure we are all everyone's on the same page. And then when Brian's talking about rolling the scripts and things like that to load to that, that's a value add. Because if not, you may have a person that's sitting on site for a day and a half setting IP addresses. MAC addresses, host names, and firmware when he could build a script, and that's done in 25 minutes. Again, conversation to make sure we're all on the same page of what the project needs from us to make sure it gets to the finish line. But also, we need to be accountable as a community. If we see a hole, we have to identify the hole and let everybody know ahead of time. Don't let them run into the pothole. Tell them that there's a pothole there and make sure that everyone on the team knows it. Uh, Brian, uh, what are some of those things that would make make things easier for us? And and you know, are there are there common pitfalls that that we we just have have never been able to resolve o over all this time of uh, you know doing the the uh, the job that programmers do? Documentation, asking questions, getting that. You know, I find quite frequently we we talk about there should be a theory of ops, and I, I do think that our sales team and our design engineering team does a good job of putting together the original one. But that doesn't, that's a living document, right? So I go through that and I'll get that out to a client, you know, or at least a version of that out to a client and I'll go back through and make notes. And I, I think one of the big things there too is the follow-up, right? I'm not a one conversation and done. It is, you know, going to continue to follow up to help make sure that any pitfalls that might be ahead, I can flag or I can detour around by knowing that. Um, and, and I do think honestly, Recently, that has become more of a challenge. I'm sure that you guys all see it with the equipment getting swapped at the last minute, right? All of a sudden, this is a 12-week lead time. This project needs to finish in four weeks. You know, something else has to come in its place. So, you know, having those tough conversations in those scenarios, too, of we can get you this equipment, but I cannot provide features 6, 7, and 8 with that equipment. So how do we 
either get around that or are you okay not having six, seven, and eight? And now let's update that all and, and get everybody on the same page. So I, and a lot of the times I feel like those are very difficult conversations to have, but they're very necessary. The other thing that I want to add there too, is that the, the industry hasn't really done us a favor in moving toward no code required, talking about how the programming isn't as necessary. I think that that has actually changed to your point about swapping out equipment and being able to work with and, and piece together systems with um, less than ideal uh, situations. But I, I think that the, the industry itself ha has almost minimized the value of programming by saying that you don't really need to know that much because <laughs> it, it, it just does it itself. Yeah, and I think that has honestly been a challenge too, right? Of people walk in and it's, oh, I'm going to do some configuration pages and this. But then there's always that one question of, well, I would like it to do this as well. And now you're outside the realm of that, you know, program itself thing. And it, so I, I think that, uh, I think that actually has been very hard for us, but also has been a good thing in, in people seeing a little bit more of, oh, I kind of shoehorned myself in here. Had I gone my traditional route, that's where I could have uh, gotten the additional ad there. And, and the last question, Bernard, do you know, what, what do we say to the people that are, that have continued to say that um, programming really is, is like pro programmers are not going to, going to be needed? I go back to the comment that Brian was doing right there. He put together a script to basically load touch panels, devices, set host names, update firmware. That if you have to do that manual versus the t 25 minutes that it took once he had the script in there, how many hours did that save the project? So again, I think the notion of no code, no no code needed, still doesn't have the commissioning, troubleshooting, bringing the job online. So it's kind of like you can make a bunch of different words around it, but still the knowledge that the programmers bring to the job and the efficiencies with it, with the supply chain situation, again, communication of what we're delivering can help fix that problem that you're referring to there. Because again, we, if we don't tell people what we're doing, they don't know we did it. Yeah, I like that. Unfortunately, we lost Rich because he's having, having some technical issues. So we're going to proceed uh, to, to close out the show, uh, unfortunately, without him. But I'll, I'll give his uh, spiel at the end. But uh, thank you guys for being part of this. Uh, how could people get in touch with you, Brian, and learn more about uh, what you do at Barrex? You can find me, as Uncle Richie would say, on the interwebs, uh, at Dean McGrogan on both most social medias. You can uh, learn about Barrex at barracks.com. Um, and uh, and we'd be great to, uh, to get to talk to you. Thanks for having me, Steve. Bernard, this was an awesome conversation. I have to reach out to Rich because this was, this was a good one. I loved it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for being here. And Bernard, how could people get in touch with you and learn more about ICS Plus? I think the great place to start is the website at icspluslonline.com. And from there, it just filters down. And again, thanks for having me back. I enjoyed it. And I think it was a great topic. And uh, hope to be able to do it again with you guys. You got it. Well, uh, for for Rich, you could uh, re reach him uh, reach him <laughs> at uh, for goes at design and uh, Google him as he always says his uh, Twitter or X is R for Goza. And he always says to find him here at avnation.tv. So I will uh, move forward with that. Uh, you could find this in all the other shows. Uh, please ch take some time to check out the sponsors to help that help make this and all the other shows possible. And there's a lot of great content on the website. And uh, we uh, encourage you to not only continue to listen to this show, but also uh, branch out and listen to some of the adjacent shows as well. There's, there's a lot of great stuff there. And there's also a lot of great people that you get to know and uh, meet through listening to these podcasts. For me, you can reach me at Steve Greenblatt on social media. You can reach my company, Control Concepts, at controlconcepts.net. And I also do a, another podcast with James King called Ask the Programmer. And if you don't mind checking that out, we do some similar content there and uh, love to uh, hear your feedback on that. Uh, please always, as always, leave a, a message, a rating, review, some feedback. And if you're interested in being a guest on the show, reach out. We'd like to hear from you. And with that, this has been A State of Control. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is, is AV, AV Nation. Nation.
This is Anthony Nation.